Thank you very much. Kia ora koutou katoa, ko John Edwards tēnei, te mana mataponu matatapu. I've been working in this area for almost 30 years, and every couple of months, couple of times a year, uh, there'll be a headline or a front cover, privacy is dead, they say. Uh, this has been going on since um, the 1880s. Uh, in fact, the first um, academic article in the United States about a right to privacy was called the right to privacy, and it was by a couple of lawyers who, uh, who went on to become Supreme Court judges, um, Warren and Brandeis. They were reacting to a new technological development being the portable camera. These Boston uh, law lecturers were worried about the uh, effect on their privacy of busybodies with their box brownies snapping them at their social events and publishing the results uh, in the local gossip columns. And so they wrote this article called The Right to Privacy, which uh, spawned the, um, the tort in uh, US law anyway. So we see it uh, on and on through the ages. Privacy is dead. Usually those words are uttered or reported by people in whose interest it is for that to be so. Um, but privacy endures. Anybody who thinks today that privacy is dead simply hasn't been paying attention. In the last few weeks, we've seen at least five careers ended because of a lack of respect for privacy. Uh, these were uh, mostly national politicians. Uh, and that wasn't a result of um, privacy law enforcement. It was simply a revulsion at the lack of respect for uh, personal information, uh, particularly sensitive uh, health information. Uh, and our survey results bear out the enduring importance of privacy to the population. Um, so whether you get punished by fines or uh, sub public opprobrium, um, you know, a failure to take into account privacy is not just a compliance issue. It's an issue about the viability of your business and your market or the social contract that you have with the people for whom you are providing services. Uh, people in our surveys, we do this every two years, uh, uh, reporting escalating concerns over your ability to respect uh, their personal information and to keep it safe and secure. I wanted to tell you about the changes to the Privacy Act. That's the hook that's got me in here. That's what's um, uh, kept you here, even though you would probably have preferred to slip away at um, afternoon tea time um, after the lovely uh, creamy confection that Mr. Woodnorth is still scoffing away at. <laughs> but it would be presumptuous for me just to jump in and uh, tell you what the changes to the Privacy Act are, because that would presume that you care as much about privacy as I do uh, and know what the 1993 Act says. Many of you will, and to, for those of you, I just beg your indulgence for a minute while we bring everybody else up to speed. There's no point in telling you what's changed unless you know what's there already. Our Privacy Act is um, based on some pretty basic concepts. First is the concept of agency. The agency is the entity which has obligations under this law. It's defined in the Privacy Act as a person or body of persons, whether corporate or unincorporate. So it's your golf club, your book club, the physiotherapist, your kid's music teacher, the insurance company, the bank, the church, etc. It goes right across the economy. And those agencies are obliged to meet obligations in respect of personal information. And personal information is defined in the Act as information about an identifiable individual. Right? Not sensitive information or private information or health information or financial information. Information about an identifiable individual. Now, when you put those two components together, you see that we have a law that has to deal with an infinite variety of kind of transactions involving uh, all manner of human activities. How do you do that? In law, there's two ways you can do that. One is the prescriptive approach, 
I used to work with David uh, at Inland Revenue. Revenue acts are prescriptive. You have to have a law which tells you exactly what you have to do if you are a seasonal worker uh, with an income of X who works Y hours and has three kids. There'll be a section which tells you exactly what your obligations and commitments are. That's why the Revenue Acts are quite fat. The other option, because if you think about the challenge of a prescriptive approach in regulating all the different variables of personal information use, you would have a law that filled libraries. The regulators decided instead to go for a, an approach of general principle, and this is based on uh, recommendations of the OECD. The OECD came together in 1980 to think about the implications of this new technology, the personal computer. And they, there's somebody being quite chatty behind me there, it's a little bit distracting. Hi. I'm just having a chat to these people out here. Thanks. <laughs> so where were we? We were in 1980, uh, and a, a, a working group of the OECD uh, were tasked with setting out some general principles for the protection of personal information in an age where individual control and autonomy could be taken away by the click of a button and information could travel around the world. Uh, so the New Zealand legislators decided, well, okay, those, they set out principles to guide member states, we'll just grab those and put them in our act. And so those principles became the information privacy principles. They govern the life cycle of personal information into and through and out of your organization. So the first four are about that front end, your obligations in relation to the collection of personal information. Don't collect it unless you need it for a legitimate purpose. My colleagues in Europe call this the data minimization principle. If you don't have it, you can't get into trouble with it, right? So it makes sense. Where you can, get it from the individual concerned directly. Tell people why. That's the third one have a really clear statement and be able to explain what you're collecting, what you're gonna do with it, who's gonna get it, where people need to come if they wanna see what you've got on them. Don't collect information by means that are unlawful or unfair or intrude to an unreasonable degree uh, on individual privacy. So that's at the front end, personal information collection. Once you've got it, you've got an obligation to keep it safe. It doesn't say how, and it doesn't prescribe the standards or measures. It says you've got to take such steps as are in the circumstances reasonable to ensure the information is kept safe. So, you know, the, the registration list for this event is probably sitting on that table. We're not particularly uh, high security over it. I could hover there with my QR scanner and flip to phone mode and have all your personal information. That's not a big deal because it's not that sensitive. It's only your name and your uh, uh, email address or your professional association. But with your COVID diagnosis information, for example, you would expect a much higher level of security. Principle six is um, a really foundational principle. You have a right to access your own personal information wherever it is held. How many of you are lawyers here? It's a few. Let me tell you, one of the things that I really like about my job is learning from international colleagues. And one of the favorite things that I've learned in this job is um, that this right of access, which in New Zealand has been available in respect of the public sector since 1982, and has been described by our Court of Appeal as being of constitutional significance, in Latin American jurisdictions, they call this right of access habeas data. So you see what they did there? They reach back to the most fun fundamental and foundational of human rights writs. This is the ability that you had back in the 15th century to hold the king to account if you, if you were um, uh, detained. You get a writ of habeas corpus, which means bring up the body. And it meant the king had to produce the person 
and show the lawful justification for their detention. So when in Latin America they're thinking, well, what's this right of access to personal information? Habeas data, show me the information and justify your, uh, your, your detention of it. So I think that's a charmer. Um, that remains in our law a central feature. Principle 7 says once you've exercised that right and got access to your personal information, you're entitled to uh, correct it if it's wrong, incomplete, uh, or misleading. Then we come to accuracy. I call this the poor person's judicial review. Uh, you can make a complaint that an agency has failed to ensure that some personal information of yours they've used is complete, relevant, up-to-date, and not misleading. You didn't give me the job because you thought I was a pedophile? Well, no, that was the other John Edwards. You really should have checked that. Uh, that's a lot of things, uh, but it's also a breach of principle eight. Uh, we see this in um, credit reporting quite a lot, uh, mistaken identity or disputed debts affecting people's credit. Principle nine, don't keep information for longer than you need it. It's kind of the corollary to um, uh, principle one. Ten, don't use personal information other than for purposes for which you've collected it. And when you've collected it, you've told people You've got your license because you've told people why you're going to collect it. So as long as you've told them all the purposes you have uh, for having it, you're not restricted when we come to 10 and 11. Now, we've come all this way, and finally we arrive at the one thing most people think Privacy Act is all about, which is don't tell anyone anything. That's only one of 12 principles, 13 under the new Act. And again, it's to a significant degree uh, self-regulating. You can decide who you're going to give the information to uh, as part of your business processes. As long as you tell people up front that that's the plan and you've got a freely operating market to uh, obtain those services with different privacy settings, uh, there's nothing to prevent you from disclosing information uh, to all and sundry if, that, if you're open about that. Now, Principle 12 under the 1993 Act is about the use of unique identifiers, but we get a new Principle 12 in the 2020 Act, uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later. It's about the movement of personal information outside of New Zealand. So that's where we are. When the Law Commission examined this law from 2006 to 2011, they, they began a bit skeptically. Um, Jeffrey Palmer led that work. He was never a big privacy fan. He didn't put privacy into the Bill of Rights Act in 1990. Uh, and he was uh, dubious about this very general, open textured, uh, general principle based law that requires organizations to exercise judgment at every turn. But by the end of it, in 2011, he was convinced. And his report said the foundations of this law are sound. So let's not chuck it out. We'll keep the principles, we'll keep the um, harm-based enforcement, which I can talk to uh, in a little bit more detail in a moment, but it needs a bit of a refresh, it needs some modernizing. And he and his colleagues recommended half a dozen or so uh, policy initiatives. Uh, in 2014, the then Minister of Justice, Judith Collins, uh, made the government's response to the Law Commission recommendations and said, we'll do these things. Um, and then there was a change of ministers, and the drafting got slow. I went to see that minister, the new one that came in after Judith Collins. When I came back to the office, I said, I've got good news and bad news. She's really interested in privacy. And she decided to put things on hold for a while while she re-examined the Law Commission report and the regulatory approach that she thought was most appropriate. So nothing happened for another few years. And then Andrew Little came in uh, as Minister of Justice under this government. And seeing as how we went to the same school together, I had an early coffee with him and said, look, there's a bill just sitting there. Why don't you just stick it in the house and we can sort out the details and select committee. And official said, no, don't do that. We've got to take a bit more time over it. Um, but he, to his credit, agreed. Uh, we got a bill into the house heard submissions last year, it came into force, well, it, it, it was passed about six weeks ago, it comes into force on the 1st of December of this year. So, what I have taken to telling audiences is that on the 1st of December 2020, 
we will have a Privacy Act fit for 2012. <laughs> the big new thing, one area that we've fallen well behind uh, our other jurisdictions is mandatory breach notification. You'll recall that as I was running through those information privacy principles, I got to number five. Now, who should I point at? Do you remember what number five was? Oh, you can't see the laser on you because it's on you. <laughs> number five was you keep information secure. Uh, you are entrusted with personal information. You are the custodian, the kaitiaki of this taonga. If you don't honor that information, if you lose control of it, then you have to give back control to the individuals. If you sit on your breach and don't tell anyone, then the person is harmed twice. Once by the fact that you've failed to protect their information, second by the, their uh, inability to take steps to protect themselves. You know, as we were working on this law, uh, Telecom came, as it was then, and said, oops, Yahoo, who run our uh, email program, says they accidentally lost half a billion email addresses. And then they came back a few months later and said, um, you remember that thing we told you about? Well, actually, it was three years before then, and actually, it was a billion. So they had not told anyone, which meant that a billion email credentials with sign-in, you know, usernames and passwords were available for people to search on the dark web were being traded uh, and used for all manner of malicious purposes, and people had not been told, so they couldn't take steps to protect themselves. Mandatory breach notification means if you fail to protect information, you have to tell me, but more importantly, you have to tell the individual concerned so they can um, change their passwords or change their mother's maiden name or, or, or cut up their credit cards or whatever it is. Um, they can get a new uh, passport or whatever. Um, and the mandatory part is that if you don't do this, you could be fined uh, up to $10,000. Now, it's not all breaches that you have to notify. It's only ones that could cause serious harm. And a lot of industry was very concerned about, well, what does that mean? How do we know? Privacy, as we all know, is a very subjective and contextual uh, value. What's private to me, you might not care about, and vice versa. So Parliament listened to those concerns and put some criteria for assessing serious harm. And I think this was important because I don't want to know about the fact that you were emailing all the play center parents and you accidentally put all the addresses in the CC field rather than the BCC field. Now everybody knows everybody else's email address as well as the fact that Johnny's allergic to gluten. Um, so there is this threshold. It's designed to prevent uh, the important messages getting drowned out by that trivia. It's also designed to try and prevent people succumbing to um, uh, paroxysms of anxiety over constantly being told that you've buggered up their personal information. Um, so the threshold uh, test of serious harm is determined by the sensitivity of the information, right? The success that you've had in retrieving it. I have somebody in my office called Elizabeth. She was a young lawyer. She's not there anymore. But um, I got an email from the Law Society into my um, inbox, and it said, um, women in law mentoring from um, experienced women lawyers for new women lawyers. And I thought, I know one of them. And so I forwarded that email to Liz, uh, and then to my horror realized that instead of sending it to Elizabeth of my staff, I'd sent it to Elizabeth Denham, who is the um, information commissioner for the United Kingdom. Um, she was a bit puzzled as to why she was being given the opportunity to to be mentored by um, the New Zealand Chief Justice. Um, so these things happen, um, but 
you know, in that case, it's a trusted, you know, firstly, the information's not very sensitive. Second, uh, I could take steps to mitigate. I could ring that person and say, hey, I've sent you this thing. Can you delete it? She goes, yep, it's all good. Uh, it's not going any further. Um, so how widely was it distributed? How was it secured? If you get home tonight and put your hand in your pocket to find that USB device with all your client files on it and realize that it's um, probably sitting on the floor at Te Papa somewhere, um, if that device had a password protection on it and encrypted data, then probably you don't need to um, uh, notify me. So these are some of the things. Uh, we can maybe come back to that in question time. Um, I did uh, draw to the attention of the Minister of Justice that my colleagues in the United Kingdom uh, and in Europe are able to issue fines to people who breach these kinds of laws uh, of up to 4% of global revenue. And in fact, um, Elizabeth Denham issued a fine of 180 million pounds to British Airways. Um, last year, I said also, um, the Federal Trade Commission, who carries out functions that I have in the United States, issued a fine of $5 billion to Facebook. Uh, my colleague in Australia has an ability to find. So I, I went to the Minister of Justice and I said, you know, this is what regulation looks like. Let's have some of that. And he said, you can have compliance notices. So we've got this law with this set of obligations and principles that you've been required to comply with, name check, um, for 27 years. And now... I'll be able to come along and say, hey, you're not complying with that. Here's a notice. <laughs> saying you've got to comply with it. So that'll be good. Um, those notices will be enforceable in the Human Rights Review Tribunal, so that does give us a bit of an edge. I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm not grumbling anymore. Um, I've, I will uh, apply the, par the law that Parliament has given me. Uh, there are some new criminal offences. Um, I talked about the importance of that habeas data right, everybody's right of access to their own information. Uh, if you respond to an access request by firing up the shredder or hitting delete uh, on the keyboard, that will be a criminal offence to destroy information which has been requested under Principle 6. Um, it will be an offence for anyone to impersonate another person with the objective of uh, obtaining personal information about them. So if your place runs call centers, uh, this I, I, I can tell you this is going to uh, manifest through um, estranged partners behaving badly. You know, you know enough about someone to answer a few security questions to get through that sort of layer of, sec of, of security protection. Um, the, you know, th those, those people will be uh, subject to prosecution for that. Uh, I will be able to make binding decision on access requests. Again, another sort of tweak to my enforcement power. Um, at the moment, uh, I can't, you know, if, if I investigate your decision to withhold David's information, I get to the end of it and say, well, I think you should release it. And you can say, okay, well, that's very interesting, but see you later. And then David has to go to the Human Rights Review Tribunal and have fresh litigation that could take three years. A binding decision on an access request will mean that I can say, well, you must now release that information. And if you don't agree, uh, then the, uh, the burden of litigation is on you uh, to uh, contest my determination in the Human Rights Review Tribunal. Extraterritoriality um, is a long word. It means the law having effect beyond the boundaries of the jurisdiction. There's a presumption in law that uh, the law only applies to people in the territory. Um, and it should be explicit if it's to go beyond. So we have a lot of businesses that are carrying on business in New Zealand that do not have a legal presence here, that do not have employees here, that do not have a brass plaque or a legal um, incorporation here but they are competing with local businesses. 
They are taking revenue from local businesses, and they are collecting personal information about New Zealanders. So those businesses will be subject explicitly to the New Zealand Privacy Act. That still is going to present some challenges in enforcement. I mean, the Fair Trading Act is, uh, you know, has extraterritorial effect. But when the, the Commerce Commission decided to take action against Viagogo, a Swiss-based company that sells non-existent tickets to gigs, um, they found it really difficult to engage with that organization. And then the, the one time they showed up at court was to contest the jurisdiction, and they won. And the court refused to issue the orders that the Commerce Commission was seeking. The Commerce Commission won on appeal, but that whole proceeding you know, probably cost in the neighborhood of a million dollars. Uh, and that's just one case. I have 900 cases a year. So if we're going to be taking on Facebook and Google and, and the like, um, we'll be choosing our, uh, our opportunity very carefully. Um, and the cross-border provisions uh, means that um, if you are sending personal information to another agency that is not subject to the New Zealand Privacy Act, that is not within the jurisdiction, you'll need to uh, undertake some inquiry about the legal protection available in that destination jurisdiction. Uh, if there is not a comparable level of protection, you'll need to take some steps such as applying model contract clauses to protect the information. Or getting the explicit and informed consent of these um, individuals. So those are the, um, the high points, the, 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 the sort of new policy initiatives. They're not enormously significant. Um, and I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about what's been happening for us this year. Uh, obviously, we started out the year, like everybody else, with plans. Um, uh, and then we had to sort of throw those away and start again. We've been very busy with um, COVID-19 matters because suddenly um, a whole lot of businesses, almost every uh, business in the country, has had to collect a whole lot of personal information that it never used to have to, had to collect. Um, so the first day of the first round of level two, I went to my local tavern, as is my want, and I saw a register on the desk, and I saw the names and phone numbers and email addresses of everybody else in the joint, um, and I added mine, and then I went home and I wrote a blog post saying, you know, what um, the hospitality industry should be doing in terms of contact tracing. And we've been doing uh, similar stuff since, uh, since working with um, the Ministry of Health, um, working with uh, astroturfing tech bros um, and various other um, interesting issues which have arisen, which I can talk about if there are questions. Um, I think I might just skip through these slides so we can get to question time. Did you want me to, um, how long did you want me to go on for, Dave? I can't remember. Until 10 to 4? Okay, cool. Thank you. So um, what can we expect when we move to mandatory breach notification? Um, we have been running um, a voluntary system, and public sector agencies have been pretty good and diligent in notifying us when things go wrong. Um, we're running at about 250 reports a year. Now, when our colleagues in Australia moved from a voluntary to a mandatory system, they saw an increase in reporting of about 700%. Um, we've um, built a system that's going to be on our website called Notify Us, which will allow you to make the reports. Um, it's um, the brief that I gave to our developers was assume these people don't know anything about the Privacy Act and anything about their obligations. What they know about is what's happened to them, so our system needs to convert that knowledge into um, the information they need about whether, they, uh, whether it's a reportable matter. So we get a lot of reports of things which are probably not meeting the threshold of serious harm, but are, are interesting to know about nonetheless. And the vast majority are email um, errors. And contrary to the innocent little vignette I gave you about my correspondence with my uh, UK colleague, um, most email errors, in fact, involve you sending the most sensitive information 
to the absolute worst possible person you could think of, the one with the biggest ax to grind against your organization, um, who then holds it for ransom and goes to the press and causes great distress. So it is something to tr sort of try and um, get your head around and get ahead of uh, and um, constantly remind staff and management uh, of the near misses and the steps to take to um, avoid an innocent error becoming something um, catastrophic. And you know, catastrophic is a word uh, that you could mistake for hyperbole. It's not. I mean, you know, I've seen in the time I've been, well, even before I was commissioner, um, the Bromwyn Puller matter, which cost a ministerial position, a chief executive position, four board positions, and millions of dollars worth of restructuring at ACC was caused by emailing a spreadsheet. Uh, EQC emailed a spreadsheet of 80,000 earthquake claims to Brian Staples, who was the guy who had set up a lobby group that was the anti-EQC lobby group. This is the way these things go. So do try and um, set up systems in your organization to capture and learn from uh, the near misses and the mistakes. Um, and this is the opportunity to do that with the new act coming in. Employee browsing is something that we um, see quite a lot of. That is somebody who has authorized access to your information systems using that access for unauthorized purposes. Uh, and it's very difficult to um, avoid except by constant messaging about the culture in your organization. One thing that I would suggest that you do, if you can, if you have access logs in sensitive uh, files, is every month grab 10 or 15 or 50, depends on your organization, uh, access log events and go to the person who uh, access the file and say, hey, I see on this day you were looking at John Edwards' file. Why was that? Now, they probably won't remember. They might say to you, listen, I, I, I do coding on 200 files a day. How, how am I supposed to remember that? Or they might say, yeah, John Edwards was here. I was helping him with a thing. Doesn't matter. What they will remember is that somebody asked them to justify it, and that will drive that culture of respect when I was in practice, um, I was talking about this with um, a district health board, and they said, no, well, don't worry, we've got a system based on trust. Yeah. Well, you know, a system based on trust is not really a system. Um, but they also said they had, a, they had protections to, to protect against employee browsing, because if anyone prominent came into the place, they would have special protections placed on them. And I'm like, okay, that's great. Um, so if, if somebody tries to look up Peter Jackson, you're going to find out about it. But the real risk is the records officer or the receptionist uh, checking up their daughter's new boyfriend. And no A-list or B-list uh, is going to um, detect that kind of thing. So employee browsing is important. Website errors, I'll come and give you a couple of examples of. Um, you know, the, the ubiquity, the, the, the democratization of um, the digital domain uh, has meant anybody can stand up their own website. But it's like the old rule about novels, right? They say everybody's got a novel inside of them. Most of us should leave it there. <laughs> Just because you can stand up a website doesn't mean you should. And a great example of this was with the TUIA 250 breach from the Ministry of Culture and Heritage. Do we have anyone here from the Ministry of Culture and Heritage? Okay, so I'm going to be mean to them. Um, TUIA 250 was um, a, 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 a series of commemorations of the encounter between Cook and Tangata Whenua. Uh, and as part of that, um, somebody set up a website that was just to function as like a bulletin board, really, just to notify people of the events. You know, what's going to happen for um, 2 e 250? Where's the ship going to be? And so it doesn't matter that, you know, you got your daughter to code that up one night. Um, 
that's fine. They didn't go through the normal procurement channel and the normal security checking channels because it was, as I say, just this kind of bulletin board. But then a few months later, someone said, hey, um, why don't we have a competition, generate a bit of public interest, um, and we'll give people the opportunity to paddle a waka out to meet the vessel, um, and we'll award it to, I don't know, half a dozen to, to, to a dozen people or something. But you've got to be a New Zealand resident or citizen. Um, and someone said, oh, yeah, we can just put a plug in on the website. So I think it was a WordPress, it was one of those things. Anyway, so the person who de designed the, the, the uh, website as a bulletin board grabbed this plugin, which enabled people to register their interests, upload their uh, documents, uh, and six months later, somebody rang the Ministry of Culture and Heritage and said, someone's just tried to use my son's driver's license to obtain credit, and the only place he's used it was when he signed up for your um, two-year 250 thing. And the thing was subsequently reviewed and found that um, when you uploaded a document, it went to a public-facing platform. So this was not a security failure or a security breach, because in order for there to be a security breach, you have to have security. This was the equivalent of pasting those documents on lampposts up and down Lampton Quay. Um, they were just simply uh, searchable on the open internet by anybody who um, wanted to do a name search or search New Zealand driver's license. Um, and so 300 driver's licenses, passports, and even firearms licenses uh, were uploaded. Really quite um, significant stuff. That would certainly meet the threshold for reporting. Um, the Ministry of Health matter I've got there, uh, what was that one? That was the two order breach. Uh, so that was a PHO, which um, had um, their website defaced in a cyber attack. And as they reviewed that, they found that there had been some malware placed uh, on the server that would have been prevented uh, if they'd applied the routine patching. Uh, and it had sat there for about 18 months or something, um, making vulnerable up to a million health records, uh, but with no way of knowing how many, if any, of those records were accessed or exfiltrated. So there's that. You want to keep an eye on those kinds of things. I mean, how do you keep an eye on those kinds of things? Um, it's about asking the question. Someone's developing a new functionality, a new website, um, a new business process. Has anyone done a privacy impact assessment? Have we done a security assessment? These are the kinds of questions that um, your chief executive or chairman of the board will uh, be grateful for you uh, having asked. So you have an opportunity um, in 2020. Now, I know that you all comply with customers, um, which means you're dealing with dozens of legislative requirements, uh, and you know your board expects you probably to pay more attention to the Health and Safety Act or the Commerce Act, depending on your domain. Um, but this is privacy's moment. You've got an opportunity to say, there's a new act, you know, lie to them. Tell them that it does more than it does. Get their attention. This is the one opportunity to say, look, the Privacy Act's coming in on the 1st of December. Are we going to be ready? We've got to invest. We've got to prepare a plan. Uh, I think having a, a, a reporting plan would be really important. Um, if you've got a governance uh, body with a risk and audit committee, they should be asking what your um, uh, breach response plan is. They should be asking, how do we know that we're not gonna be prosecuted for failure to report a notifiable privacy breach? That will lead you to develop a system for internal reporting of near misses and assessment of actual breaches. That will be an enormously valuable resource for you. Whether you report these things to me or not, you will get the opportunity to learn from those, uh, to change practice, to raise awareness, to build your culture, uh, and to avoid liability. So do all these things. I won't go through them all. Um, but one easy low-hanging fruit is exploit our e-learning. We've got 
blog posts you can sign up for um, to get sent all our content. Sign up for our newsletter, you get all our blog posts. If you need day-to-day -day, um, assistance, we've got a facility called Ask Us. It's a sort of reasonably intelligent FAQ. Every time you ask a question, uh, you'll either be delivered content, which is related to that question, or we will harvest your unanswered question and write content for it. So you might not get what uh, you need, but you've done us a service and the next person to ask the same question a service. Um, and these are our online um, learning modules, which we've developed in conjunction with learning works in Waikato. So that means we bring our Privacy Act expertise and subject matter expertise. Uh, we combine it with professional educators to deliver uh, really easily consumed um, resources. Now, back to preparing for Privacy Act 2020, the very least you can do is circulate this one. Everyone in your organization will be able to do this Privacy ABC. It doesn't talk about section this or section that or what the Supreme Court said about the Privacy Act's relationship with the Search and Surveillance Act. It's just a really basic awareness raising about respect for personal information. It just gets people thinking. Because the greatest risk, I think, with personal information is complacency. When you're working with it every day, it ceases, you cease to see the value of it until it slips out the door. So that's just going to reinforce um, some really basic hygiene. This one, Privacy 101, probably most of you would benefit from. Certainly your privacy officer in your organization should have done it already, and if they haven't, they can do it. Your HR person should do employment and privacy. And there we go, that's the end of the slides.